Okay, I think we can begin. Good morning, everyone. We are pleased to have David Weinberg to speak to us today. David is a distinguished university professor and chair of the astronomy department in Ohio State University. His expertise is in cosmology and large scale structure, and he works on many different topics, um, including galaxy formation, cosmic acceleration, and chemical evolution in the Milky Way, which we will hear more about today. David has close ties to the community here. Uh, he got his PhD from Princeton and was a long-term member at IAS. In fact, David is on sabbatical here at IAS right now, so expect to see him around. Um, David has shared his slides with a link that you can find in the top of the chat. You can download it and follow along if you prefer to do that. During the talk, if you have any question, uh, please use the raise hand function or notify me. Uh, my name is Jeffrey in the chat and I will find a good time for you to ask your question. So with that, uh, welcome David, and please take the floor. Thank you. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here physically in Princeton, uh, even if I'm only virtually in uh, all of your rooms. And the, um, uh, I'm, my virtual background here is, is actually in Madrid in 2009, but uh, I am sitting in an office uh, in the Institute for Advanced Study. It's the first time I've worked in an office for, uh, for a number of months. Um, some of you have known me for decades uh, and know that, that I kind of uh, split, my, uh, split my time between uh, physics of galaxy formation and uh, aspects of cosmology like dark energy and dark matter. Um, that's still the case. Uh, at, at, uh, at lunch, I'll say a little bit more about uh, the things I'm currently interested in on the um, uh, on the dark matter, uh, dark energy side. Uh, but most of my work on the, the galaxy formation side over the last five years has been focused on the Milky Way galaxy. Um, and the, uh, and I was really drawn into this by, uh, by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And particularly at the time that we were beginning uh, SDSS-3, um, there are two big new surveys, one of which uh, was BOSS, uh, the other was Apogee. Um, so BOSS is using upgraded versions of the Sloan spectrographs uh, to measure millions of galaxies. Apogee involved a new uh, infrared spectrograph uh, that could obtain high resolution spectra of, uh, of stars in the Milky Way. Uh, here are 10 examples of uh, Apogee spectra. And you can see that they're not your typical Sloan spectra. They are uh, higher resolution by about a factor of 10, higher signal to noise by, a factor, uh, by about a factor of 10. Um, and the uh, and working in the infrared allows Apogee to observe all those parts of the galaxy where the stars actually are, um, and having this high resolution and high signal to noise uh, allows uh, measurement of kind of detailed chemical fingerprints of uh, it was about 150,000 stars in Sloan three, and now that we're coming to the end of Sloan four, uh, it's up to about 400,000 stars. Uh, and they're observed in, in, uh, on a grid of fields um, uh, across the galaxy. Uh, so the, the cyan fields are the ones that were in Sloan 3. Uh, others are from Sloan 4. Uh, red are being observed from the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, and we get about 17 elements per star. We do, the quality of those measurements measure, uh, varies. Don't get every element for every star, but most of these elements uh, we get for for all of the stars. So as Apogee was starting, I was you know very much thinking, uh, what are we aiming to learn from these 400,000 chemical fingerprints? And that uh, I think this comes into to two connected but distinct categories. We want to learn things about uh, the assembly history, the star formation history, the chemical enrichment history of the Milky Way galaxy, and we want to learn things about the origins of the elements, uh, what kinds of stars produce them, um, what physical processes within those stars. So unpacking each of those two questions a little bit further, um, our, our big questions on 
the history of the Milky Way. Uh, we'd like to know the origin of the main morphological components, the thin disk, the thick disk, the bulge, the halo. For each of those components, we'd like to know when they accreted their gas, when they formed their stars, um, whether there were uh, mergers that contributed to making them up. Um, we know that uh, some uh, degree of gas and heavy elements are ejected from the galaxy uh, by star formation. We'd like to know how much and with what history. Uh, and we're interested in how stars and gas move through the disk over its lifetime. I'm interested in all of these questions uh, and working on them, but, the, uh, but I will give them somewhat short shrift today um, and uh, give more focus to the second category of questions. Um, it has to do with uh, the element yields of the two main categories of, uh, of supernovae, core collapse supernovae uh, and white dwarf supernovae. Uh, to calculate yields from those. You also need to know the mass distribution of, of young stars, the stellar initial mass function. Uh, you care about which of those massive stars explode and release their energy uh, elements and which of them collapse to make black holes uh, and take their elements with them. Um, there's a lot of uh, interest in the progenitors and, and the physics of type 1a explosions, which affects the kinds of, of elements they produce. And we're interested in knowing about other potential sources uh, of, uh, of elements from uh, intermediate mass stars, from neutron star mergers, from other kinds of, uh, of exotica. So uh, I'm gonna try and cover three topics, uh, alpha to iron versus iron to hydrogen. And if you don't know what this notation means, I'll explain it shortly. Uh, that'll be part one uh, in Part two, which will be the largest part of the talk, um, I'll talk about uh, ratios to magnesium for a bunch of different elements X um, that Apogee measures. Uh, and then I'll finish talking about deuterium and black hole formation, which hopefully sounds like a bit of a, a, a non sequitur, but I'm, uh, I'm aiming to uh, particularly to provoke uh, Bruce Drain and Ed Jenkins and, um, and maybe Adam Burrows uh, by the time I get to that part. So uh, I have lots of collaborators uh, on this work. Uh, Jennifer Johnson, my OSU colleague, and, uh, and Ralph Schoenrich, uh, former postdoc, taught me much of what I know about chemical evolution. Uh, among many Apogee collaborators, John Holtzman has been the, uh, the most heavily involved in, in this work and responsible for a lot of what's happening on the Apogee abundance measurements that enable it. Uh, I've had uh, a series of, uh, of great uh, graduate students, and particularly uh, now a lot of my work is with James Johnson and Emily Griffith, um, and two of the postdocs at OSU working on current projects are Fiorenzo Vincenzo and Tuggolder Suckbold. So part one. Um, alpha elements are elements that you can create by adding an alpha particle to a carbon nucleus. So oxygen, neon, magnesium, silicon, sulfur, calcium, titanium. Um, and these are elements that are made uh, quite well in massive stars that develop these, uh, these shells, uh, starting with helium burning uh, and adding alpha particles on top of them. So the late stages of a massive star has uh, the sort of onion shell structure of successive alpha elements buried deep inside uh, a red giant. Uh, and then when the star explodes, all of those elements are released, uh, produced during the star's lifetime. And then there's additional synthesis of heavy elements that occurs during the explosion itself. Uh, type 1a supernovae produced by the thermonuclear explosions of white dwarfs. You start usually with a carbon and oxygen white dwarf, uh, but it's very dense. The explosion uh, burns things to close to nuclear statistical equilibrium. So most of what's produced are the most bound nuclei, uh, iron and nickel. So the core collapse supernovae come from massive short-lived stars and they produce uh, mostly alpha elements, uh, but also iron peak elements. And the type 1a supernovae, uh, which take longer to go off because uh, you have to uh, make the white dwarfs, they have to merge or have uh, stuff added onto them. Uh, they produce principally iron peak elements. So the kind of um, Ur diagram of, uh, of chemical evolution 
uh, these days is something like this. So there's an x-axis that indicates overall metallicity. Um, and uh, this is on a scale that's logarithmic with respect to the sun. So zero means solar metallicity, minus one means a tenth solar metallicity. And then on this axis, there's a ratio of alpha elements, which might sometimes be just one element or might be an average of several, to the iron peak elements. Um, and so this is showing uh, apogee stars uh, at the solar distance from the galactic center. Uh, and you see these two distinct sequences, uh, often called the low alpha sequence with ratios roughly solar, uh, and the high alpha sequence, which has uh, high alpha ratios relative to the sun. Um, this bimodality has been seen uh, going way back. Uh, in particular, <coughs> thick disk stars with hot kinematics tend to lie in this, uh, be the, they're the filled points here that have high alpha abundances thin disk, uh, cooler uh, kinematic stars uh, have these uh, lower alpha element abundances. So the, uh, the basic way you should, uh, you should think about this um, is, uh, so I'm, I'll describe a, a, a one zone model. One zone means the assumption is that, that the gas uh, and the metals within that gas are always uh, fully mixed. But this is a model that can have uh, inflow, uh, like the water coming in from this tea kettle, uh, enrichment coming from uh, whatever is brewing inside the pot, um, but also outflow uh, coming out in this steam that may be carrying out hydrogen gas, but also some of the elements being produced. So uh, at early times, What's being uh, produced are the, uh, is just the core collapse supernovae, which are the things going off most quickly. And they are uh, increasing uh, the amount of iron, but also they have an, an oxygen to iron ratio that's set by the, the ratio of those yields. Um, and then as time goes on, you start to get some type 1a supernovae as well. So the iron abundance continues to grow, but now uh, the population starts to move downward in, uh, in this uh, diagram because there's a higher ratio of iron peak production to core collapse production. So uh, these timestamps get crowded together at the end and you can see that uh, the metallicity doesn't keep on increasing arbitrarily. Uh, things approach a sort of equilibrium where uh, stars are continuing to form but the abundances are staying about the same. So we can understand that equilibrium by thinking about uh, this differential equation for the mass of oxygen in the interstellar medium. And here I'm considering uh, a model where stars are forming at a constant rate. So there's oxygen being produced with some yield, um, which I've designated YO, multiplied by the star formation rate. Uh, so that's a source of oxygen, but there's also a sink of oxygen, um, which is, uh, the current amount of oxygen, uh, abundance of oxygen times the star formation rate, that's going into stars. And then there's also gas being driven out uh, and eta uh, is this ratio of the outflow rate to the star formation rate. So we're losing metals to outflows and to star formation. We're gaining some metals back, which is, are the metals uh, of, that go into stars, but then come back out when the stars evolve and lose uh, lose their envelopes. And so this recycling fraction for typical stellar IMF is about uh, 0.4 or so. So if we have constant star formation, then there's a balance between these sources in orange and the sinks in blue. Uh, when the oxygen abundance has some equilibrium value, which you can just about read off of this equation by imagining we want this left-hand side to be equal to zero uh, at equilibrium, um, and, uh, and, that's, uh, and then if you divide by the mass of gas, you find that, that you'll get an equilibrium abundance uh, that's the yield divided by one plus eta minus r. So this outflow has a big effect on, uh, on what the yield is. And in these models, I'm assuming that infall is occurring at a rate that balances the losses from the star formation and outflows. So there is dilution of these newly produced metals. So even though the stars are continuing to produce more oxygen, some of them's going away, some of it's getting diluted, and the actual metallicity itself is staying constant. Um, and in this case, you can actually find a, a full uh, uh, solution to this equation um, for the oxygen abundance as a function of time. 
Um, and it turns out you can also do that for the iron abundance as a function of time. Because the iron uh, is coming from type 1a supernovae, uh, the oxygen grows quickly with time, the iron grows more slowly with time. Um, and so we start up up here in this diagram and then evolve downwards. David? So there's many, yeah. Uh, we have a question from Omar. Good. Uh, David, uh, so coming back to your previous equation uh, on the top of the previous slide, yep. uh, you are assuming that uh, the release of oxygen happens without any delay, right? So you're basically neglecting this lifetime of the supernovae. Uh, in That's right. So, so this, this equation is, uh, is in an instantaneous approximation for the supernovae which is pretty good because the time scale for actually forming new stars out of gas is a few hundred million years. And the longest lived of the supernovae, uh, the massive stars are sort of 30 million years. So but if, if you were using type 1a supernovae, you would probably need to use a different one. That's correct. So actually over here for the, for the type 1a contribution to the iron, I am including time delays. And so what's actually, what was novel in these uh, analytic solutions was figuring out how to do it for a delayed type 1a distribution. Thanks. Yeah. Um, and overall, in terms of, of what, uh, what determines what these, uh, what these tracks look like, uh, the things that are the most important, uh, this sort of turnover depends on how efficiently stars are forming, because that tells how high a metallicity you can reach before the type 1a supernovae have time to start going off and drive you downwards in this diagram. And the endpoint depends principally on this outflow efficiency eta, um, because if you have large outflows, you're losing lots of oxygen, um, you're losing lots of iron, so the equilibrium is here at a lower abundance. <clears throat> Um, and then how much you drop here depends on the relative yields of the core collapse and type 1a supernovae. Um, another thing that comes out of sort of thinking in terms of this equilibrium is there are things that can perturb that equilibrium. So you might be uh, evolving along and have a sudden burst of star formation. If you have a burst of star formation, that tends to produce more of the alpha elements relative to iron. So you jump up uh, in this diagram before settling back down. So you can produce these late, late bumps in alpha to iron. Or if you have uh, the outflow efficiency accrete at, uh, increase at late times, you can get over to here, but then actually have the metallicity of the population evolve backwards uh, because you're uh, ejecting more and more of your metals um, as uh, with this higher um, outflow efficiency. And so at late times, you can be producing less metal-rich stars than early times. Um, so there are various uh, somewhat counterintuitive things that can happen. Um, but now let's return to the, the observations uh, from Apogee. So this is in the solar annulus. And because Apogee is observing red giant stars, they're luminous, they can be seen throughout the disk um, we can, uh, and throughout the galaxy we can actually compare uh, what happens in different regions of the galaxy. So in each of these diagrams, it's always uh, that same diagram I've been showing. The sun is always at zero, zero. Uh, but you can see in the inner galaxy, we have uh, more metal-rich stars. We have more of these high alpha stars. Uh, the outer disk, we have very few of these high alpha stars. We have more metal-poor stars. Um, this diagram from a 2015 paper um, by, uh, by Hayden et al. is still, I think, my favorite of the, uh, of the Apogee plots. Um, and it's a kind of more complete version of what I just showed you before. So this axis, the horizontal axis, is distance in the galaxy. So these middle columns are near the solar annulus, inner galaxy on the left, uh, outer galaxy on the right. And then the bottom row is mid-plane, uh, middle row is 0.5 to 1 kiloparsecs above the plane, uh, and top row is one to two kiloparsecs above the plane. And what you can see is that, that in many locations, uh, we do see these two sequences. If you see stars on the upper sequence, they're almost always in about the same place, um, uh, that, but, uh, but the relative numbers of stars on these sequences uh, vary 
uh, a lot with, uh, with position. And also, if you look at just the distribution of stars along this axis uh, in the midplane, along the metallicity axis, uh, the shape of that abundance changes, uh, that abundance distribution changes. So, uh, so in these sequences are basically independent of location, but the distribution of stars along the sequences depends very strongly on, uh, on radius and on height. And as you go from the inner galaxy, you get this kind of uh, skewed metallicity distribution function, which peaks uh, at a high metallicity. Um, as you go outward in the galaxy, not only does the metallicity overall drop, but the shape reverses. So now you have a long positive tail uh, and uh, a hump at low metallicities. And the sun kind of happens to be in a place where this distribution is approximately symmetric. Um, other interesting things uh, have come out of looking at the ages of stars in Apogee, which can be estimated in a number of different ways. Um, and the, uh, so if you look uh, at these low alpha sequence, there's actually a big dispersion in age. Um, and most of the stars on this upper sequence are old, but there's a handful of young ones. Um, and in this work by Diane Foyer, uh, she looked near the solar neighborhood uh, and took slices in metallicity and looked at the age distribution uh, of stars. So there's a point at the median age and the bands show the sort of si inferred 16 to 68 percent, um, 16 to 84 percent interval. And something that's interesting is actually the solar metallicity stars in the ne solar neighborhood are the youngest. And the metal poor stars are older, that's not too surprising, but the metal rich stars are also older. Um, and there's a very strong trend of, of uh, age with this alpha to, to metal ratio. So there's, uh, I could kind of spend the rest of the talk on uh, justifying the assertions on this slide, um, but I'm gonna go on to another topic and just tell you uh, that I think uh, this changing shape of the metallicity distribution function with radius probably has to do with the motions of stars through, uh, radially through the disk over its lifetime. Uh, the vertical trends uh, plausibly come from, from shrinking of the gas disk uh, as it's forming, vertical shrinking, um, and then some subsequent dynamical heating of the stars. Um, this wide range of ages and the old age of the metal rich stars probably means, uh, again, this radial migration with the metal rich stars coming from the inner galaxy. The young alpha rich stars may be partly from stellar mergers that rejuvenate the stars, maybe from those bursts of star formation uh, that I showed perturbing uh, the, the equilibrium. Um, and uh, there's a number of possible explanations of the bimodality which I'm not going to go into um, here, but I'd be happy, I have lots of thoughts on them um, and I'd be happy to, to talk about them in questions afterwards. Okay, so let me go on to part two. Um, uh, again, these are ratios relative to solar, but now uh, I'm gonna focus on magnesium as a reference instead of iron uh, as a reference for reasons I'm about to explain. So, Having done uh, Hayden et al., the natural thing was to go on and do it for the other uh, uh, elements measured by Apogee. Uh, and so the first obvious thing to do is just do these uh, X to iron versus iron to hydrogen diagrams for all the different elements that Apogee measures. And here's an example uh, with aluminum. And it's got the same basic structure, uh, inner galaxy here, outer galaxy here. I, I haven't gone quite as far out as before, uh, mid-plane uh, and above. And you can see some stuff in this diagram, but it's, it's a little hard to tell what's going on. Maybe things, are, uh, things look uh, sort of similar from place to place, but, uh, but certainly the locations of stars are different. Um, things become more clear if we actually separate these two populations, the high alpha stars uh, and the low alpha stars, uh, in this case, uh, separated using magnesium uh, to iron. So if I just color these stars red and color these stars blue, then you can see that actually what's going on with aluminum is uh, we're seeing uh, different, uh, different trends for the high alpha and low alpha stars. 
Um, but for any given population, they're not so different from one place to another. Um, and what's changing really is the mix uh, of the high alpha stars versus the low alpha stars as we go from one place to another. Um, but there are these differences between the red points and the blue points, but those differences are really being driven by the iron. Right? So it's the fact, it doesn't actually tell us anything new about aluminum. It's just that these stars have more iron in them. Um, and so uh, things make more sense uh, if we actually ref uh, make our reference magnesium, because magnesium is something that basically comes from one process, from the, um, uh, which is uh, just from core collapse supernovae. Uh, so, uh, so we simplify things by not using iron as our reference because iron has a more complicated uh, source. And so for aluminum in particular, uh, we see the, the blue and red lines are the same in all panels. They're the median trends uh, over uh, for the entire sample. And you can see basically uh, the, uh, the trends for the individual stars are almost independent of location. So now we can do this for lots of different element ratios. Um, this is literally the OMG plot, um, and it's actually very boring uh, that the ratio of oxygen to magnesium is uh, pretty much uh, almost exactly solar, uh, whatever metallicity, wherever you look in the galaxy. Um, and that's what you would expect uh, if oxygen and magnesium are both coming uh, almost entirely from core collapse supernovae with metallicity independent yields. So this is uh, a plausibly simple result. Here's another example um, of manganese, which is, uh, so this one looks more interesting. So first of all, there are now big differences between the red points and the blue points. Um, so the, the low alpha and high alpha stars. Uh, and that's an indication that a lot of the manganese is actually coming from type 1a supernovae. So when you add iron, uh, going from red to blue, you're also adding manganese. There's also a strong metallicity trend um, within each of, of these populations, but that trend is nearly the same no matter where you look in the galaxy. So, uh, so the red point, uh, the, again, the red and blue lines are the medians defined from the entire sample, and the black points are the medians uh, in individual locations, and there are slight deviations uh, up here, but for the most part, uh, the medians in any given location in the galaxy track the median of the entire sample. So that holds true for all the different elements that, uh, that Apogee is measuring. And the, um, uh, so there are alpha elements uh, circled in cyan here. Uh, there are odd Z elements, so light elements that have odd atomic number, uh, which means they need free neutrons to produce them, uh, which I've circled in yellow. Uh, and then these are iron peak elements measured by Apogee. Um, and again, there can be nucleosynthetic differences between those that have odd and even uh, atomic numbers. So because the trends are the same throughout the disk, we can basically take the high signal to noise stars uh, anywhere and look at the trends for the entire sample. Um, and the, uh, and so here, uh, I'm showing all the alpha elements over here, these light uh, odd Z elements here, uh, the iron peak elements with odd and even atomic numbers over here. Um, and uh, again, the blue points are always the high alpha stars, the red points, the low alpha. And there are lots of different things you can see here. Uh, some of these elements are measured be uh, better than others. Uh, sodium and phosphorus are both measurements that are uh, where Apogee uh, doesn't, do, uh, doesn't do as well. Um, but you know, for the alpha elements, we see similar trends for high alpha and low alpha stars, as we'd expect, because these are dominated by core collapse supernovae. But this separation indicates some of the silicon is coming from type 1a supernovae. More of the calcium is coming from type 1a supernovae. Um, and, uh, and when we look at the iron peak elements, for instance, we see stronger metallicity trends if we look at the odd Z elements than the even Z elements. Um, so to interpret uh, these trends, uh, we introduced uh, this uh, two process model. Um, and the idea is that the, 
uh, the element abundances of any given star are the sum of a, a core collapse process and a type 1a process. So the, um, so the ratio of element x, uh, the uh, abundance of element x relative to the sun is just some amplitude of the core collapse process multiplying this process vector, which uh, holds for all the different elements, uh, and some amplitude of the type 1a process multiplying this process vector. Um, and so these Qs, these process vectors, are things that uh, in this model are determined by nucleosynthesis, by the, the, uh, what uh, the IMF average yields of core collapse and type 1a supernovae are. And the, um, whereas these amplitudes, uh, the amount of core collapse or type 1a elements, uh, are things that just uh, are specific to an individual star. Uh, and they're defined so that in the sun, each of these things is one. So uh, with this uh, approach, the other things that, that we uh, assume are that magnesium is a pure core collapse element with a metallicity independent yield. So that means this Q for magnesium is just one, uh, and this one is zero. And that iron is a mix of core collapse and type 1a. So we use the iron to magnesium ratio as the thing uh, that tells us uh, the relative values of, this, uh, of these amplitudes in a star. So that allows us to infer these process vectors by fitting the observed median sequences, and then to predict all of a star's abundances. Um, we can predict them to a pretty good approximation using only the magnesium and the iron. Um, so, uh, so this is an example. Uh, now I'm using data release 16 data instead of data release 14, which I was showing earlier. Uh, so for the alpha elements um, here, uh, you're seeing the median trends uh, on the, all the stars and then the median trends in large points on the left. Uh, and over here on the right are the inferred values of these, uh, of these Qs. Um, and uh, for instance, you can see that uh, oxygen is referred to be uh, almost all uh, core collapse uh, with a small contribution from, it's probably not actually type 1a supernovae, it's probably AGB stars, but some kind of delayed source. Uh, calcium has more of a contribution from, uh, from type 1a relative to core collapse. Um, and we can do similar things for, uh, for other elements um, and uh, so manganese, pick another example, um, has, uh, that's the one element that, that really has a dominant type 1a contribution um, and also some metallicity dependence uh, to these trends, which would indicate metallicity dependence of the underlying supernova yields. David? Yeah. Question from Michael? Yep. Hi, hi David. Um, when we look at these plots, um, is the scatter dominated by measurement error or is that intrinsic scanner? Good question. So it's some of each um, and, and that depends on, on the, the element. So for, uh, for sodium, say it's dominated uh, by measurement error, but for, uh, for these, at least for manganese and for iron, it's uh, some measurement, but also intrinsic. And uh, you know, I would say the thing that I'm going on to working on now is mostly about trying to understand the sources of that intrinsic scatter okay, um, and see what can that tell us. Particularly, it's interesting to ask, okay, in the deviations from these predictions, you know, if a star is high in manganese, is it also high in cobalt? Is it low in sodium? So that's how you can go about trying to learn uh, right. some other lessons. Okay, thank you. Um, I, uh, let's see, so yeah, so um, we've also looked at data from the GALA survey, uh, which is an optical survey um, and stands for Galactic Archaeology with Hermes. So here you see uh, Hermes across the Milky Way holding a GALA, which is an Australian bird. Um, and so my graduate student, Emily Griffith, uh, has analyzed the data from GALA, uh, which gives us uh, some of the same elements, but also some new ones, uh, carbon, uh, some, iron uh, some iron peak and iron cliff elements here, uh, carbon and zinc are sort of where you're falling off the iron peak, and also 
uh, some, some neutron capture uh, elements that are thought to come from AGD stars. Um, and Gala, uh, at least in this data release, was mostly looking at dwarfs, so they're stars in the solar neighborhood. And if you didn't have the results from Apogee, you wouldn't necessarily know that you could use the solar neighborhood results to tell you about abundance ratios throughout the galaxy. But at least if these other elements are behaving like the Apogee elements, then we know from Apogee that these trends are kind of there throughout the disk, and we can look at a local sample uh, and learn things about the nucleosynthesis. Here are the new elements. Um, there's a lot of things one could say here, but I'll just point out, first of all, that the um, if you look at the points, that's, that's the data. Don't worry about the lines so much here. For the neutron capture elements, uh, we actually have these non-monotonic uh, trends that, uh, that the ratios first rise and then fall uh, at high metallicities. Europium uh, is uh, thought to be an R process, uh, is an R process element. It clearly has some prompt component because it's there even for metal poor uh, alpha rich stars but there's also some sort of delayed component. So if you have more iron, you also have more europium. Um, and carbon similarly is showing uh, some contribution, a uh, large contribution from core collapse supernovae, but also some delayed contribution as well, appearing in the separation of these sequences. Um, so with, uh, by applying this uh, model to the observed sequences and trying to infer things about uh, the, uh, the supernova contributions, we can then try to test theoretical predictions, partly of what is the fractional contribution of type 1a supernovae to, uh, to a given element, um, and also uh, predictions of the core collapse supernova yields themselves. So this is plot is, yeah, go ahead. Jeremy, you can ask yep. a question. Oh, I just wondered, um, when, when one looks at dwarfs, is there, there any evidence in the data for selective settling of elements, uh, depending on charge to mass ratio or things like that? Because in the yeah. absence of mixing processes, I mean, I guess giants are fully mixed, but dwarfs, not necessarily. Yeah, that's right. So one, certainly one of the, the potential complications in any of these is, uh, is whether the abundances you're looking at are the birth abundances. Um, so there can be settling of some elements in dwarfs. I think that's probably a relatively small effect compared to others, but I, uh, but I don't know for sure. Um, I think the, uh, with giants, um, Apogee actually measures carbon and nitrogen, both of which are, are quite interesting. Um, but the reason we're not using them is the carbon and nitrogen in the giants are actually uh, heavily affected by processing in the giants. Um, so that's why, you actually, uh, that's why you actually need to observe the dwarfs or subgiants if you want to get at the birth carbon abundances. So, um, so yes, the things that the stars do to their surface abundances can matter in some, for some elements in some regimes. Um, and you can look at different temperature regimes and so forth to try to, to pull that apart. Uh, so here, there's a lot going on in this plot, but the black and red are determinations from Gala and Apogee uh, separately. Um, those you know, mostly agree reasonably well, but not always. Uh, some interesting results, Apogee and, and Gala both agree that a lot of the sodium is coming from something other than core collapse supernovae. That's quite different from what the theoretical models predict, that it should be almost all uh, a core collapse element. Um, these uh, new elements in, in Gala, um, scandium and copper, uh, both appear to have a, a big uh, type 1a or other delayed uh, contribution. Uh, the europium is inferred to be, uh, have a significant prompt component, but also uh, some, uh, some delayed component as well, uh, ditto for carbon. Um, so these, uh, there are uh, various things one can, can look at in, in this diagram. But the other thing that we uh, were able to do uh, is to say in the sun, based on looking at these overall trends for other stars, for any given element, here's the fraction that we think comes from core collapse supernovae. 
And therefore, we can try to, to test the yields predictions of the core collapse supernova models in a way that's, that's not sensitive to all of these, these other aspects of galactic chemical evolution. Um, because we know different things are going on in the inner galaxy and the outer galaxy, but the similarity of these trends means that the trends are, are imprinted there by, by nucleosynthesis in a way that's fairly insensitive to those other things. So um, one of the, the big questions in this, uh, in this topic is which of the stars actually explode and which uh, collapse to make black holes. Um, and that's uh, a hot topic now. And one of the interesting things uh, there is that uh, if you go up in mass, it's not that you go from stars that, make, uh, that explode to stars that collapse. There appear to be uh, you know, interesting regions where you get a lot of collapse uh, and then regions where you get uh, new explosions. Um, so there's this fairly complicated uh, prediction, uh, predicted explosion landscape, which has to do with the inner structure of the stars and how it gets affected by different uh, shells um, and how compact that makes the supernova progenitor. So in these predictions, these are different engines uh, going from a relatively not unenergetic engine to a relatively high energy central engine. Um, so more stars collapse up here, but there's still this kind of uh, complicated landscape. So these are predictions by uh, Tuggledor Suckbold and his, uh, his collaborators. Um, and so uh, for work that uh, Emily Griffith and James Johnson are doing now, we're taking Tuggledor's uh, yields for his models that explode, but then he's also kind of forcing explosions for some of his models that actually want to collapse to form black holes. Um, and we can predict uh, the yields element by element um, for, uh, as a function of mass. And we can now introduce different assumptions about which of these stars are going to uh, explode and which of them are going to uh, collapse to make black holes. And you can see that there are uh, you know, sometimes these quite interesting uh, mass trends. Uh, and so as you change your assumption about which of these, uh, which of these stars are going to explode and which ones are, are going to uh, collapse, you're going to get different predictions for the relative abundances uh, of these different elements. Um, and so here are predictions for the absolute yields of a bunch of different elements for four different cases. So there's this, uh, these two uh, different uh, models for, uh, for black, the central engine with black hole formation. And then we also said, okay, what if we just make all of the stars explode all the way across the IMF or all the stars up to 40 solar masses explode and then the ones above those uh, don't explode. So, you can then look at the predictions. Um, here, what we've done is to force all of the star, uh, say for all of the models, we're going to assume that they match the solar magnesium. Um, and one of the, the things that jumps out, and I think this is a problem in other models as well as Tuggledor's uh, models, but they're certainly uh, pretty strong here, is if you produce magnesium in the sun, then you way overproduce the oxygen. Or alternatively, you can say you'll produce the oxygen in the sun and, uh, and you don't match the magnesium. Um, but you, you have to pick one or the other. Um, if you match the magnesium, then uh, some elements are heavily overproduced, uh, like sodium and copper. Um, and you know, for trying to distinguish whether there really is or isn't this complicated uh, black hole landscape, uh, we're interested in, in separating these points, the N20 and W18 uh, models, from you know, these uh, purple and uh, purple points where you're just exploding the low mass stars and maybe not the high mass stars. So these uh, circled in blue are some of the elements that look like they would be good discriminants for whether you are or, uh, or are not um, uh, having this kind of uh, complicated black hole landscape. David? Uh, yeah. Eric has a question. Go ahead. Uh, so does the di discrepancy between the O and magnesium depend on the outcome of sort of the solar oxygen debate? So it would depend a little bit. Uh, I mean, so, at, so it would depend, I think, at the, uh, you know, 30% level, uh, because you do need to decide what oxygen you're, you're trying to, to match. Um, but 
this discrepancy is more like a factor of two and a half to three. Um, so it's not going to be removed by that. Um, and this is just doing the opposite of, of matching the oxygen uh, and, and uh, then you're under producing the magnesium. But yes, not knowing the, the solar oxygen abundance is, uh, is a pain um, for trying to, uh, to assess this. And my overall take on this so far, this is work in progress, but is um, we're able to identify what look like they should be interesting discriminants. Unfortunately, the agreement between the, uh, the models and the data is sufficiently poor that it's, um, it's a little hard to decide, uh, you know, what conclusions we can draw uh, at the moment. But we'll, um, you know, we'll try to uh, do the comparisons we can with existing models and, and sort of identify directions for the future. Um, that sort of summary, so it will come back at the very end. Um, let me uh, finish off with, um, uh, with uh, my, my third topic on deuterium and black hole formation. So uh, now I've gone back to just the overall yield predictions of these elements. And the only difference is now I've, I've normalized them to the amount of that element in the sun. And for Eric's question here, I'm using a loader's uh, oxygen abundance in the sun, which is fairly similar to the kind of Asplendish uh, abundances. So one thing you can see is that um, the yield, uh, I, and this is the IMF average yield, if you explode all the stars, um, is about three times the solar oxygen abundance. But you know, I told you earlier that the equilibrium oxygen abundance should be the yield divided by this one plus eta minus r. So if all the stars explode, then if you wanna have solar oxygen abundance, you need fairly healthy outflows, you need this eta to be about uh, two and a half or so. On the other hand, if you take uh, these, uh, the models with the most black hole formation, they form a lot less oxygen, the factor of two, uh, two to three less oxygen. Um, and then uh, you would want uh, much less in the way of outflows. So previously I was talking about the relative yields of different elements, but you know, can we actually tell whether you know, we're really up here or whether we're really down here? Um, and so an interesting clue to that comes from deuterium. Um, so uh, exercise, uh, if you haven't thought about this question before, as you've uh, probably said in talks or taught your astronomy class, all of the oxygen atoms in your body were once inside a star. Um, so that leaves the interesting question, what fraction of the hydrogen atoms in your body were once inside a star? Um, so. Uh, While well, you think about that, you know, the, the, the key to answering it is to know that uh, deuterium is produced in the Big Bang um, with the deuterium to hydrogen ratio of about two, two and a half times 10 to the minus five. But stars destroy all of the deuterium they're born with. So during the protostellar phase, uh, convection brings the deuterium down to a temp uh, region where it's hot enough to get fused into heavier elements. So here was the previous equation for oxygen in this one zone model. Um, here's the equivalent equation for the mass of deuterium. Now the source is actually infall that is bringing in uh, uh, deuterium at the primordial ratio at this 2.5 times 10 to the minus five. Um, and again, we're losing uh, uh, deuterium that's going into stars or being ejected in outflows. Um, However, we don't have this additional source uh, from recycling because any recycled material that comes out of the stars also doesn't have any deuterium in it. So you can solve uh, these equations. Um, and it turns out that the solutions follow this nearly universal curve in which the deuterium abundance is the primordial abundance divided by uh, this factor, which is the recycling times the oxygen abundance divided by the yield. So here, there's a bunch of different uh, models on here, uh, and I've done other more complicated models, and the circles are just this formula. Um, and so in general, as you have more oxygen, you've had more enrichment, more of your interstellar medium consists of stuff that came out of stars. Um, if that stuff came out of stars, then it doesn't have deuterium, so the deuterium ratio is lower. So the higher the oxygen, the lower the deuterium uh, you would expect. 
Uh, but you can see that this yield of oxygen is appearing in here. So there's a hope of constraining it uh, from the observed deuterium. So the observed deuterium uh, in, the, um, in the interstellar medium, there actually it varies a lot from sight line to sight line. Um, and so here is what, as best I can tell, is still really the, the premier study of this from 2006. Um, and so on some sight lines, the deuterium to hydrogen ratio is low. Uh, but Bruce uh, has argued, I think convincingly, that that's because of depletion of the deuterium onto dust. And that the true, uh, the indicator of the real ISM value are these high points um, where that dust has been destroyed. And that, um, uh, and that is up at about 90% of the primordial value. So that tells you that 90% of the interstellar medium has never been inside a star. So the interstellar medium doesn't consist of, uh, of primordial, of, of stellar envelopes. It consists uh, of about, uh, you know, five sixths, uh, 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 about 90% primordial uh, and, and 10 to 15% of uh, recycled stellar envelopes. So now, here is the value of this, uh, this eta, the outflow mass loading that you need to get to solar metallicity um, would be these points. So again, if all the stars explode, you need a fairly high eta. Uh, if most of the stars make black holes, then you don't need much in the way of winds. But now you predict a very low deuterium abundance, only about 70% of the primordial value, um, because more of the ISM, if there's a low oxygen yield, more of the ISM has to be recycled stellar envelopes, and that would be uh, absent deuterium. So here's the Linsky et al. data point, um, and you know, the prediction if all stars explode is sort of bang on what's observed, but these models are you know, at least marginally inconsistent. One of the questions uh, that uh, Eve Ostreicher and Mark Krumholtz and others uh, pushed uh, at me when, uh, when I uh, discuss this in a Galactic Wind Symposium is, well, what happens if winds are not just lifting off ambient ISM, but if they're carrying out uh, the supernova ejecta and then some, uh, some entrained stuff? Um, so I said, that's something I, I need to think about. Um, and uh, finally, uh, being in quarantine here the last couple of weeks uh, gave me uh, time to, to think about it and I think solve it. Um, and turns out that, that if you uh, eject the uh, supernova uh, ejecta and some entrained material, um, in the case of oxygen, this is exactly equivalent to reducing the oxygen yield by some factor. That's the fraction of the type 1a I'm uh, sorry, of the core collapse yields you're retaining. Um, and for deuterium, it's sort of the same as before, except uh, because you're losing supernovae, uh, but not AGB uh, in these direct winds, the, the effective recycling factor is higher. And that means that you actually have a lower deuterium abundance for a given uh, average yield. So actually, you can get away with weaker winds to match the observed oxygen, but you, uh, you have an even more uh, uh, severe problem in producing deuterium with a low oxygen. Um, and the answer to the exercise for the audience is that since 90% of the uh, ISM uh, hydrogen is primordial, that means 90% of the hydrogen atoms in your body, which is about 50% of your atoms in total, uh, came straight from the Big Bang. Um, this is a list of, of ongoing uh, future uh, projects, some uh, all of which I'm hoping to work on uh, during this year. Um, and I'm open to collaboration on, on many of these. Um, I think I will just uh, put up this uh, summary slide and take further questions. Thank you. Uh, Bruce has a question. Go ahead, Bruce. So Beautiful talk, David. So uh, I love it. Um, but Christensen, Dalgard, et al. have recently had a paper where I think they used HARPS data uh, on a stellar sample and Gaia distances to very precisely characterize a sample of stars. 
and they me measure uh, metallicity as a function of age. And I think their uh, results are consistent with a sudden infall of hydrogen rich material about 7 billion years ago, diluting the ISM at that point by about a factor of two or three. Um, how would sudden events like that fit into your continuous model? Right. Um, so the um, uh, that's a good question, and and one of the things that uh, you know, I, I talked about, uh, or I, I said I, I skipped over uh, the this question of why are there actually two sequences. Um, and I think this is something where there are multiple uh, potential explanations. Um, one of which is uh, the one illustrated in the sort of second figure here, uh, where, uh, where the conjecture is that you have a kind of evolution along this, uh, this high alpha sequence that gets you to a fairly high metallicity. And then in this model, um, so it goes back to work by Capini and, and Matteucci. The, um, uh, you then have a big influx of hydrogen uh, about 10 billion years ago or 8 billion years ago that drives the metallicity back down. Um, and then it sort of, you know, loops again. You have a burst of star formation that increases this alpha to iron. Uh, and then you produce the low alpha population mostly uh, subsequent to that. I think that um, so. I think one of the one of the questions I have is: you know, Do you need a sudden event like that to produce this bimodality, or can you get it by basically you know migrating stars from the inner and outer galaxy, so that this low alpha sequence is not really a sequence at all, but just a superposition of different populations? So that uh, I think is is one interesting question. Another thing related to, to late, uh, it, so in addition to this, uh, these old in, influx of hydrogen, there's some evidence for a fairly recent burst of star formation about 2 billion years ago. Um, and that may be important in understanding why the solar metallicity stars in the solar neighborhood are so young. Um, it's really hard to get those kind of 2 billion year old uh, minimum uh, uh, those, sorry, those, those two billion year median ages for the, for the solar metallicity stars. Thank you. Uh, next question from Wen Yue. I start with it. So earlier on, you, you said there's a, a prompt and delayed uh, component in the yellow beam. So does that give you some constraint on the, I guess, the product of the yield and the uh, the massive coconut supernovae. So I think the, um, you know, the question of whether you need to have some of the europium coming from, uh, you, you know, we, we, have good reason to think that some europium is coming from neutron star mergers and the neutron star mergers, you know, probably have a delay time distribution whose shape might be like that of type 1a supernovae, but maybe they start, they start sooner. So an, an interesting question that I don't have an answer to um, yet is whether, whether that's enough if you just took the delay time distribution uh, that's predicted for neutron star mergers, could you produce all of the europium that way and still get this split between the, um, you know, the high alpha and low alpha stars uh, that we observe? Or do you have to have some of the europium coming from, you know, at least some subset of massive stars? You know, maybe it's the collapsars that make gamma ray bursts. Maybe it's, you know, the, the, rapidly spinning magnetars. So maybe there's something that produces europium uh, a lot or earlier. One caution there is, you know, so we're looking mostly at the kind of solar, near solar metallicity. So this is a different regime from looking at, you know, these, these very metal poor stars where people have also looked at, at europium that way. Thank you. Next question from Sukanya. Um, 
Um, <clears throat> uh, thanks, David. So I think you said that the models with black hole formation have low oxygen, and uh, some people have uh, argued that uh, massive black holes might also form in, in the outer disks of uh, galaxies like the Milky Way. In terms of these discriminants in the black hole uh, landscape scenario, do you see any evidence for that? You mean for the, for a difference between what's happening in the outer disk versus the inner disk? Right. Um, so I, I would say we, we don't see evidence for it. Um, this question of, you know, how, how strong is the, uh, how strong is the evidence? Uh, I, I don't know if we've got evidence of absence or just uh, absence of evidence, but the, um, if I go back a ways to um, say this plot, and, and again, you can make this plot for all of the different elements that, that Apogee measures. And you know, we know that in, in this part of the galaxy and you know, this part of the galaxy, you, know, you look mid-plane inner galaxy, above plane outer galaxy or mid-plane outer galaxy, lots of things in these regions are very different. Um, the star formation history is different. The characteristic metallicity is different. Um, and yet, these kinds of, of uh, abundance ratio sequences are, uh, are the same. So I think that tells us that the nucleosynthesis processes have to be pretty similar. Um, and so, so you can't, uh, for instance, have all the massive stars exploding in the inner galaxy and have you know, a lot of black hole formation um, in the outer galaxy, uh, at least at, at the same metallicity, uh, because that would change the, the relative nucleosynthesis, uh, the relative abundances too much. Um, and then there's a question of, you know, how big a difference can you get away with? Um, and, and that's a more quantitative question. We've also looked most, uh, my Emily Griffith just had a, a paper on looking in this in the galactic bulge, you know, to try to see are these ratios the same in the bulge as they are in the disk. And really we didn't know if they'd be the same or not because that's a very different environment. Things form much earlier, maybe supernovae are different, um, maybe black hole formation is different. But in fact, these abundance ratios are the same in the bulge as they are in the disk. Thank you. Uh, Eric, go ahead. In the context of exoplanets, we're always trying to measure ages of isolated field stars. So I'm curious, with a, a good understanding of the kinematics and, and a good chemical inventory, how precisely could we get ages for you know, main sequence GK stars? So I think the, um, you know, the things that uh, the things that Apogee has used for, uh, for getting at ages have either been astro seismology um, and uh, where we're basically getting the mass of the stars, but because they're red giants, um, we know they have to be, be evolved or, uh, or else they are, um, uh, or else it's using this carbon to nitrogen ratio that's, that's also telling you about the mass of, of the star. So unfortunately, those things are kind of specific to red giants. Um, and the, um, I would say part of what we learn from, um, from this very wide uh, oops, dispersion between age and metallicity is that, you know, it's hard to use the chemical abundances to actually give you much more information uh, on the age. So I think the only way that this is going, you know, can potentially help is that we can, I think, use these results to say more about what are the right mixes of elements to be putting into the stellar models, which may give you somewhat more accurate um, isochrones and, and atmosphere models. Uh, and that may improve the ages somewhat. So, so Mark Pinsonow and I in, are interested in that in application. Wait, the uh, bottom right panel there looks to me pretty good if we just used alpha. Uh, that's true. So, so it is the case that I think the, uh, um, so if you 
have stars that have, you know, are above alpha of about 0.05 or something, then you actually start to, to have a pretty good, it, then you, you, for the most part, know that, that they're old and you have a reasonably good discrimination. So, so the trouble is, if you're looking at basically solar alpha stars, then you have this pretty wide range. Um, that's the whole thing of interest. But, uh, but I think you're right that, uh, that if you are getting to, um, to moderate alpha enhancement, then you've got a pretty good indicator. Thanks. We have two more questions from the audience, but we are out of time. Uh, fortunately, in a short 25 minutes, we have a call and we'll start and David will join us there as well. So maybe you have a chance there. And I'm here all year and uh, delighted to talk further on any of these topics. Exactly. And uh, you can still sign up for one on meetings with David. Um, check your emails. Uh, again, the college is not here. So check your email for that link as well. Thank you, everyone. And uh, see you again soon.